Hey there, everybody. P. Pardo here from Sea Tranquility. Welcome to another episode of Monday Night Must See TV with the Hudson Valley Squares. We've got in the house tonight Chris Canzanari, Chris Allo, Ryan Scow, and Joey, otherwise known as Spaghetti Lee. What's happening, fellas? What's up, Pete? What's going on? Oh, uh, you know, living a dream, as everybody says. That's it. Today. Another Trying day in to paradise. Live. Trying to, anyway. So tonight's uh, topic is kind of a combination of two ideas, one from Mr. Allo and one from Eric Porter from In the Prog Seat. I've kind of taken both of their ideas and kind of morphed them together. And we're going to call this On the Bandwagon, Off the Bandwagon. It's actually a pretty simple concept. So if you all can put on your thinking caps for a second and think, how many times in your life have you listened to a band you really liked them, maybe bought a couple albums or maybe someone said, oh, have you heard that album from this band and you go and get it and you like it a lot. You maybe follow them for a bunch of years and then all of a sudden you kind of forget about them and the years go by, you're listening to other stuff and whatever and this band continues on, releases albums and then maybe like many years later, like today, you realize, holy shit, I never I never went back to listen to band blah, blah, blah. There's no real reason for it. This is not Jump the Shark, not something that they did that pissed you off, a shitty album, a change in direction, a change in band members. You just literally just, for some reason, stop listening to them and there's no real explanation why. And maybe in some of these instances, you actually went back to them all these years later and you're like, holy shit, 25 years have gone by since I bought an album from this band. And you know what? I'm going to go back and check them out now. Maybe that happened. Maybe that hadn't. I gave everybody the opportunity to slot that little uh, thing in if, if need be. So that being said, we've each picked out three. And uh, we're going to start with Mr. Canzanari, Mr. Rallo, Mr. Scow, Mr. Spaghetti, and myself. And we'll go round and round until we get to our uh, final pick. So, Cans, what did you got for your first choice of the day? Uh, I actually was one of the people that kind of found this tough. And uh, I had to go look back at some old stuff and, you know, through stacks of shit I had lying around. And then it became easy. It was like, you know, I'd forgotten about these bands. But then when I saw this stuff, I'm like, oh, yeah. So uh, the first one I went with was uh, Prong. You know, back in the, you know, 90s, their first couple of albums. I love these guys. I had, you know, I had a lot of cassettes back then. I had a Prong tape in that thing freaking probably for a year that album prove you wrong i was just like cranking that all the time and then one day i stopped and that had to be probably around 93 94 you know and i, I just like was looking through and i found a couple tapes today i'm like holy shit you know i know they're still around i know they played locally fairly recently yeah yeah they were so good too yeah i had to saw them. You know? so uh you know, I think I might start again there, but those guys, they just, they went whoo, away somewhere and then they just came back. So I'm going to start checking out Prong's newer stuff soon. Yeah, I was going to say, yeah. and I think in doing all this, we probably should also kind of maybe try to figure out why did we stop listening to them? You know, like what happened? So in your case, do you think it was just you moved on to other stuff or maybe they took a bit of a break and you just you never went back to them it's it's some, some thinking back you know I, I just bought a couple other albums and it was actually you know what really we were talking about 92 recently this is you know when rust in peace and vulgar display and stuff like that came out i was definitely spending a lot more time with them than prong so yeah. i don't know it just they just flew away yeah so yeah. Cool. That's a, that's a good way to start this, kick off this whole thing. They were, uh, yeah, they just played the, I saw them twice opening for Overkill. They were still, they were great. They put on a great set, a lot of energy. Uh, yeah. And I was kind of in the same boat because I, I don't know, I was never a big prong fan, but I liked the first album, Force Fed a lot. But watching them, like, yeah, these guys, they still put on a goddamn good show. I enjoyed yeah, the hell out of them. I, yeah, I remember I reading good show. things about it. I enjoyed the hell out of them. Four weeks time. ago. Yeah. Yep. And, and yeah, they were quite good opening that. up for, uh, for Overkill. Overkill, yeah. Yeah, yeah it was good. They were good. Yeah, cool, good choice. That's my right. bad, Chris yeah. Allo. Yeah, nice. Yeah, that was good. That prime was a good pick. Uh, yeah, this was. Uh, I, I thought. I uh, you know this idea kind of clicked with me because Steve Keeler mentioned on an episode months and months ago. Like, yeah, you know, sometimes there's just there's just bands you're just into, and then somehow they just poof, they just disappear on you. And um, 
Well, this band I thought of because um, I watch way too much crap on YouTube. And, um, you know, I'm a big uh, ministry fan. And I got in the ministry around 89, 90. And I seen them, I don't even know, I don't know, probably 20 times in the last 30 years, got every record. But when I was, I was watching a ministry video, like the next video that popped up on, on YouTube was Nine Inch Nails. And I was like, oh, holy shit, I used to love Nine Inch Nails. You know, I got into them around the same time. Um, I, you know, I got the, the EP and, and Downward Spiral and yeah, Pretty Hate Machine. I saw them twice on uh, Downward Spiral in 94. I thought they were awesome. And then I just completely jumped off the bandwagon. I had to look up their discography. Apparently they put out their next record was called The Fragile, and that came out in 1999. That album's really good, Chris. Okay. It's a, it's a double album. There's a lot of a lot of meat to it, but it's really good. It's well well worth going back and digging into that one. All right, cool. I'll, I'll, I'll have to check it out um, because then I looked. I mean, they have this all these records, uh, like all these records called like Ghost, I think. It's like I don't Ghost know that stuff. Four, I, I kind of got off of the, off of the Fragile, but uh, yeah, but, Fragile's but, fucking great. But after that, yeah, they broke up and came back, and you know, I'll have to, I'll have to go back and check it out. But yeah, I, I have no idea why I jumped off the bandwagon. I mean, in '99, you know, I was listening to a lot of stuff. I was starting to write for fanzines and interview bands, and you know, I was really into you know death metal and black metal and whatever else. So I, I, maybe that's why, but I don't know. I'm just, I'm just not sure. Yeah. Cool. All right, Ryan. All right, so uh, this topic's interesting for me because the first band that came to mind is the first band I ever got into. And I'm going to piggyback on Chris's uh, topic here because you mentioned Ministry, Nine Inch Nails. So you're talking about like 90s industrial, industrial metal. Well, before I got into metal, when I was like 14, 15, 13, real young, first band I ever, ever got into was uh, KMFDM. Uh, this is the first album I bought. This is actually 95, which would have made me uh, pretty young. And, you know, all throughout middle school and high school, uh, I fucking love those guys. And like a year or two after I got into them, I heard Slayer, which changed my life, got me into metal. But I stayed with uh, KMFDM right up through the uh, millennium. Uh, they broke up. They changed. They reconfigured the name to MDFMK, put out one album on a major label, then broke up again and reformed KMFDM. And they've been going ever since. And it was probably a good decade, maybe even 15 years where I just kind of like, you know, I just didn't pay exactly how this topic is. No reason at all. They never put out anything I disliked. I just kind of like, eh. And then one day I'm like, man, I should, uh, I saw they were playing at Irving Plaza because I saw them back in the day and they were fucking great. Like kind of like a ministry set, you know, just super high energy, heavy metal guitars, but also like dance beats. So the crowd's just, it's, it's wild. And I'm like, I'm going to go see them again. And I saw them and I'm like, what the fuck was I thinking? These guys are great. So I went back, I bought all their albums because they were like a motorhead deal. Just put an album every two, three years no matter what was going on in the world. And yeah, I'm like, I don't know why I ever jumped off this bandwagon. You know, obviously there's a lot of nostalgia because they were the first band I ever got into. So that plays a factor. But uh, yeah, now I'm way back on the bus. I'm, you know, I saw today they just announced a show. Yeah, I was going to say that. I just got an email. Yeah, Irving yeah, Plaza, right? Email. I'm going to be seeing them at Irving Plaza. They're fucking cool. awesome. We've never seen them live. But I'm like, I don't know what happened. Just like literally the topic of the show for like 10, 15 years. I'm just like, just gone. For no no reason at all, because I thought about, like, why did I kind of stop listening to them? And I have no reason. Just maybe other bands just never got around to it, you know? Got pushed aside by other stuff I was into, but, uh, yeah, I'm way back into them now, 100%. So, their newest album came out, like, a year or two ago. It's fucking awesome. So, I'm back on the train. Nice. Oh, cool. Spaghetti Lee. So, I kind of misread the description of what it was we were doing. I thought it was more of uh, bands that we were into, and then um, I got into other genres and just kind of shelled it. Um, so, the bands that I wrote are a lot of legacy bands. They're sort of well-known bands, and I'm just going to kind of go with that. And I'll explain that um, very, very early on, in the very early, late, mid-late 80s, I was into the Ramones, I didn't really know how to differentiate punk rock and all different genres and subgenres and, 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 and of rock and roll at, at this point. I was still pretty young, 13, 14, but I liked the Ramones. My first uh, introduction to the Ramones was actually seeing rock and roll high school on TV. 
and I, my young mind, I just kind of lumped it in with like Rocky Horror Picture Show and just, you know, or this is a movie band. And uh, then I learned, no, they were actually a pretty cool band. But right when I was getting into them, I, I liked them. I didn't particularly love them, but other stuff just kind of distracted me, which was much more heavier, much more uh, brutal, much more punk rock to me. Um, <clears throat> I've come to respect the Ramones more than I like them. I respect them more than I listen to them. I think they're more influential, uh, really influential. You know, hundreds of bands will tell you they were influenced by the Ramones. But for me, um, I just kind of shelved them at the time. I mean, I didn't dislike them. I, I just sort of like they've always just been there. Um, I go back and listen to them once in a while. I understand kind of why I shelved them because I wanted my you know, punk rock to be heavy duty, hardcore punk rock. And the Ramones were not that. The Ramones are more like Little Richard, very basic, basic stuff. And I, I remember after listening to bands like Agnostic Front and, and Exploited and going to listen to the Ramones and especially some of their ballads, it was just like icky, silly shit. And I'm like, yeah. I kind of went in and out of like love with the Ramones. I'm like, oh, this is kind of crap. But um, yeah, my first pick is the Ramones. Um, no reason to really shelve them for as long as I did. No reason to not have them in rotation. Just kind of went a different direction. So the Ramones. It's the way it happens. Yeah, yeah that's a good choice. That's a good pick. That's yeah. a good pick. Yeah. I've actually only got into them big in the last couple of years for the same reason, because I was I wanted heavier shit. And now I'm like, you know what? It's just good American rock and roll. It's just good yeah, catchy it's rock. It's like closer to Little Richard than it is to Black Flag. <laughs> totally, 100%. It really, stylistically, yeah. Oh. All right, my first pick is probably going to surprise some people. Uh, and again, I really like this guy. Um, was I think the time where I kind of just stopped listening to him. I was still going to see him live for a little bit, and then I, I just stopped buying his albums inexplicably. And this, the last album I bought from him was The Eye. I never bought anything after this. Done. Mm -hmm. Didn't dislike King Diamond at all. Just, uh, you know, this is what, 1990, I believe this came out? 90, I think. 90 or 92. Something like early 90s. And, uh, you know, I still continue to listen to Merciful Fate, but I just I just stopped listening to his solo stuff. I think, I don't know. I For me, uh, I was moving into other things in the 90s because so much was changing. You know, there's all the grunge and alternative stuff was so popular. And, you know, a lot of the metal bands we loved in the 80s were starting to do different things. Some were going back into the underground. You had extreme metal coming out. A lot of prog was starting to happen at the time. I started getting into jazz, too. And I just, uh, I don't know. Like I said, I never disliked them. I just stopped listening to them. And it, it was, it's not until the more recent years where I've actually gone back to listen to some of those King Diamond albums that I missed. And there's actually quite a few good ones. I still think the best of the early ones, but there are plenty of interesting things throughout his catalog that I missed out in the 90s and the 2000s. So uh, yeah, King Diamond is it for me. Just stop listening. No real reason. You know, Pete, that's a great pick. That was almost one of my picks, except I did like, I, I jumped with the I was the album that I, I got. And then I, for whatever reason, jumped off for like years. And then I'd like 10 years later, I did jump back on the King Diamond bag bandwagon for some reason. In between, there was those Merciful Fate reunions. So I which was pretty watching, good. watching those pretty cool. and buying those records. But yeah, which was good, the Fate reunions. Yeah. But yeah, that was, yeah. that's a good pick. I think I, for me, I, I never liked King Diamond solo nearly as much as I like Merciful Fate. True. To me, true. Merciful Fate is a really special band. And I, there's there are enough differences between the two where I like, you know, a good chunk of the, the King Diamond albums, but I don't like treasure them like I do the Merciful Fate classics. I'm right there with you. Yeah. Absolutely. I agree with both you guys. For my money of the, the first five King Diamonds are great and everything up to the eye is great for me. And after that, there's good stuff, but it's it's not like you could be forgiven for not buying anything after the eye. And I don't think anybody would be like, oh, I can't believe you didn't hear like voodoo or whatever i was just gonna say voodoo was the first one that came out i'm like yeah there's there's a record called voodoo which i kind of don't remember and there's just something okay. else and i just think there's okay. one called the, the puppet master which i think yeah. i have the master, yeah. that's just okay too a lot of them they're, 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 none of them are bad but they're just like uh, you know it's just yeah. it's like another king diamond album you know if you like it you like it but and yeah, i remember you know every year that when he would come out with something new i'd hear about it and i'd be like oh cool new king diamond and i right and i would just never go buy it and then three years go by, four years go by, and he's got another one. I'm like, oh, cool, another King Diamond. I should check that out. And I just never did. 
It's not like I didn't want to. It's I mean, you know, you only have so much money and time to listen to stuff. And that's it. That was onto other things, right? So yeah. Yeah. All right, Mr. Cans, back to you. All right. This next one. Um, I listened to this band for quite a few years, and I actually think I know why I stopped uh initially. Um uh, I, I was listening to uh geez, I'm like blowing up arch arch enemy um i listened to arch enemy up until i think it was 2011 that album chaos legions which i did not buy but i had been listening to them you know for years enjoying them for years and then i found out about spiritual beggars which i guess predates arch enemy and when I first started listening to them, I'm like, you know, this is a little bit more appealing to me, you know, at that time in 2011. And I started to like seriously check out all the spiritual beggar stuff and follow those releases when they came out instead of the Arch Enemy releases. And to this day, I think Chaos Legions, I have never even listened to that. I did buy it, but I don't think I ever even listened to it. And I just kind of gave up on Arch Enemy. Um, I know they replaced the, the, they have a second female singer now, I guess. Yeah. And yeah. Singer number three. She sounds exactly like the other one to me, but not that I've listened to a lot of her shit, but, but yeah, you know, I kind of switched to Michael Amott's other band instead of his uh, more well-known band. That's the only reason I could think of. But yeah, That's a good reason. I, I think <laughs> spiritual beggars are pretty damn fantastic. Yeah, they're great. Yeah, they they are. are good. They are. Quite different though. Quite oh yeah. Different. Yeah. But at the time, you know, after almost 10 years of listening to Arch Enemy, I was like, this is cool. How did I not know this existed all this time? Yeah. Well, you know, I mean, when you think about it, I mean, I, I dig Arch Enemy a lot, but there's kind of a formula there, right? It's like after a while, some of those albums start to sound the same. And then yeah. you know, all of a sudden, if you, it, I, I, let, I mean, let's face it, most of us probably really listen to Arch Enemy because we totally love the guitar playing. I mean, that for me was always the main draw. Yeah. I thought Angela was terrific, but I mean, for me, it was the guitar plan. And then yeah. like you, once I found out about spiritual beggars and I was like, Oh, I'm lots over there too. And then, you know, that's kind of like this kind of doomy stoner type stuff, you know, retro seventies, heavy rock. I'm like, wow, this is completely different. He's still kicking ass playing guitar in this totally different band. Let me go investigate this for a while. So I could totally see that. Cool. Good choice. All right, Mr. Allo, back to you. All right. Uh, my next choice is uh, an, uh, another one inspired by uh, another one of our Hudson Valley uh, Square people, uh, Mr. Butch Jones, who's got his uh, uh, butcher shop Facebook weirdo page group thing or whatever the hell you call it. And he did this big post today on uh, Raise Your Fist and Yell, which was an Alice Cooper record in... Um, 1987 and he was talking about how, how great it was and um i loved alice cooper in the in the early 80s you know i wound up getting like a greatest hits album for like two bucks and i knew a lot of the songs anyway and i really got into alice cooper with the constrictor record and raise your fist and yell and uh, i saw him on the raise your fist and yell tour i thought it was amazing and i was totally you know into alice cooper then for for years buying all these records, although I can't fucking name you anything off at, off of them. And, uh, but I looked, you know, after Butch's post and Alice Cooper did do 11 studio albums since uh, Raised Your Fist and Yell. And when I was looking at them, sometime around Brutal Planet or Dragon Town, which is in the 2000s. So, I mean, I did a good, you know, 14 years of buying all the new records and seeing them on every tour, but it just, I just kind of, dropped off for some reason uh like i said didn't didn't do anything bad he always put on a great show some of those records i remember them being kind of good although I, I couldn't name you anything off of any i couldn't name you a single song off of any of them now and i know i, I remember i seen i saw him once open for heaven and hell in like 2007 and i saw him like four times open for maiden and maybe that was 2010 i think 2000 you know, yeah. 12 something i don't i don't even remember but you know he was good and i was like oh cool there's another new alice cooper record maybe i should check that out but i never did um so yeah looking at it now there's like you know probably six or seven alice cooper records in a row i i, I never heard or, or bought or 
you know, saw him again headlines. So yeah, you know, this, this one fits perfect uh, for me, you know, just jumping off the Alice Cooper bandwagon. And I will say most of those albums that you missed are all pretty damn good. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm not surprised because he, he seemed to get like really heavy and uh, yeah, they're, they're, they're all pretty rocking, pretty heavy. Yeah. yeah it's, they're pretty good. I, I like them. I, I think most of his albums overall throughout his career are pretty damn solid i mean I'm, I'm not crazy about a lot of the the kind of like the blackout period stuff but i we've talked about that at noise right. here on the channel but uh but yeah i think everything he's done since he kind of came back in the mid late 80s uh has been really solid i think yeah i mean but there's a lot of it right it's a, it's another it's kind of like the the motor yeah. we're talking about off camera it's like there's there's just so, so many, many albums. Yeah. Yeah, it's so much. Yeah, I mean, like I said, 11 records since Raise Your Fist and Yell. I'm like, holy shit, that's a whole discography right there. It is. It is. And um, But yeah, I mean, the the one little looking back, the one that, which I haven't heard in years, the one that I thought was kind of a shitter was Constrictor because it was really poppy. You know, the, the production was really super thin and the songs were kind of crappy. But Raise Your Fist and Yell, I thought definitely, uh, you know, raised uh, raised a bar and yeah and um i remember a couple couple songs from like brutal planet or something were, brutal were Planet's pretty heavy fairly, yeah i do remember him going like in a in a you know much heavier direction but yeah. but yeah i have to I have to look look up some of those records somewhere sydney taylor is smiling and frowning at the same time now. yeah <laughs> well i thought <laughs> i heard i'm like hey well i'm not gonna fucking lie i'm not sydney there's all these fucking alice cooper records that i don't have you know all these tours i obviously skipped them on yep yep cool good and even that like a couple tours in the recent years i was like oh yeah you know he's playing uh, in bethel woods with with hailstorm that's kind of cool but then i didn't go and then you go. <laughs> you know, recently he came through a couple times i was like oh that's kind of cool maybe i should go see alice cooper again and i, I didn't go and then i saw the set list i was like oh man i know like every song i, I should have went maybe i'll go next time yeah, I've seen him a couple times in recent years. Yeah, great show. Still, still puts is on. He's still great. going. Is he still touring? Yeah, oh yeah. Oh, it's unbelievable. Yeah. Yeah. Was, uh, almost, yeah. I mean, the is. best part, right, is Alice Cooper was the opening act on the Motley Crue farewell tour. Like this guy's, <laughs> this guy's still going, and you guys are like, ah, forget it. We're <laughs> we're packing it in. He's got well over a decade on those guys, and like, yeah, right. oh yeah, yeah, big time. Wow. All right, Ryan, back to you. I, that is funny, Chris. I made the same. I'm like, oh, Alice Cooper's tour, and that's cool. I didn't yeah. go see. Last time I saw him was opening for Maiden several times, and he was fucking great. He was but, uh, really good. Was that like two ten or two twelve? Yeah, somewhere in there. I thought he somewhere kicked in ass. There. Totally kicked ass. But uh, yeah. All right. So uh, yeah, when I was a teenager, I got real in the Slayer. Obviously, given my age, it was the '90s. So Dave Lombardo was out. Paul Bostoff was in. So Dave Lombardo went off and did another band for a little while, who I got into pretty early because I, you know, I'm like, well, what's Dave Lombardo doing now? And this was a little before he joined up uh, for Testament for the gathering. So, but he was in a band called uh, Grip Inc. for a little while. And uh, man, I, I bought uh, the first album, Power of Inner Strength. And I bought this when it came out, Nemesis, their second album. And man, I, I fucking love this album. I don't know. It's, it's not really, it's thrash. There's like a little groove metal. It's very 90s sounding. Uh, the production is massive. Dave's drum kit sounds like a million bucks. You could kind of tell that it's his band, so the drums are giving real good emphasis. But he's, he kicks ass on it. He plays his fucking tits off. So it's really, really good. And uh, they put out three albums, and then they just kind of fucked off. And they actually put out, so what happened was they put out a fourth album in 2004, which is already ancient history, which I didn't even know about until no, like didn't, and no idea. 2015, 2016. I'm on the internet one day. I'm like, oh, I didn't know about that album. I had the first three, which... I hadn't even listened to it in a while, so I dug up the fourth one. It's really good. Uh, it didn't have that same like nostalgic, you know, pull as the first three, but I bought it for like two bucks off eBay or whatever. I'm like, this kicks ass. So ever since then, you know, I uh, I go back every now and then. I throw these albums on. This 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 one's always been my favorite, Nemesis from '97. I'm like, yeah, this this is great. It's like very atmospheric. Has a lot of like, uh, you know, one song has like this heavy tribal drumming. It kind of breaks into a thrash song. You know, it segues into that. Great album. So like, that's a deal. Where I'm like. I don't know why I stopped listening to them. They did break up for a while, then reform, and then the singer uh, passed away some years ago, well over a decade now. So they, they are permanently broken up. But yeah, in the last four or five years, I kind of went back, dug those albums out. I'm like, I don't know why I ever put them aside, because this is good stuff. Lombardo sounds amazing. The 
guitar playing is great. The vocals are great. Uh, it's very unique. It didn't really sound like anybody else in the 90s that I can think of. It didn't sound like Slayer at all, because that was like, well, you know, it's obviously Lombardo and Slayer. It's, it was thrash metal in some parts, but very, very little Slayer influence. So uh, I don't know. I think they're great. And uh, I threw it aside today, and I'm like, this album still fucking kicks ass. You know, zero regrets to uh, digging them back up. But yeah, that's my second choice is Grip Inc. Didn't, uh, did Lombardo join DRI for a while? Did some touring with them, I think? I think he might even, yeah, I saw him with DRI. Uh, was it was it DRI? I was going to say, yeah. I saw him with Suicidal Tendencies. Suicidal Tendencies, yes, sorry. Suicidal he's, tendencies. he's been in the Misfits now for like, you know, six yeah. years. Misfits, yeah. yeah wow. It wasn't wow. DRI, it was Suicidal. I saw him. I wonder what he's going to do. I did see him with Suicidal, and he was fucking great. Obviously, he's, uh, I think his drumming's only ever gotten better. You know, I love that one Testament album he was with. Now he's obviously back with Testament, but right. yeah, the, the grip big Is stuff's he? fantastic. Okay. Yeah, he joined recently. But yeah, they, all those Grip Inc. albums are awesome. Yeah, they're coming too. Phenomenal. Yeah, yeah they're touring with uh, Exodus in the near future. Yeah, I yeah, was going to say, it's like interesting too with Slayer because weeks. they kept touring with Suicidal Tendencies. Uh, this was uh, after Lombardo was out. Uh, but then as soon as Lombardo joined Suicidal Tendencies, they stopped going on the road with Slayer. <laughs> yeah, I wonder. That yeah. 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 No more. <laughs> All right, spaghetti. All right. Uh, well, my next band should be no stranger to anybody. But what happened when I got into the heavier, heavier, heavier stuff is I really shelved a lot of what I was listening to. Um, this band obviously is not going to be recording and putting out any new material. But with the recent death of Eddie Van Halen, I kind of went back and said, hey, I got to check out this early Van Halen. I never hated on them. I never really disliked them they it wasn't like well they got too popular although i will say i was never a big fan of the of the sammy hagar era at all but i opened up my mind to go back and listen to all of the early stuff all the way up to fair warning say the dave era and i love it i absolutely love it and i'm like kicking myself in the butt going why did i ever really take this out of rotation so uh, it's Van Halen. Sorry to come up with just this boring, bland, everybody knows this band name, but I did. I mean, there's two times in my life where I shelved a lot of what I was listening to because I veered off deeply down the rabbit hole of another genre. One was when Thrash hit. It made all the older metal stuff and the classic rock stuff that I was listening to just sound aged immediately. I mean, by 86, uh, you know, Judas Priest, Turbo, or, or uh, Slayer, Rain and Blood. I mean, I was a metal kid. I'm going rain and blood and everything heavy. So all that earlier stuff, even the Iron Maiden, everything got shelved. Um, the other time was in the 90s when metal started to get sound like shit in the early 1989-90. To make a choice, you know, metal started to sound crappy. Um, hardcore started to get predictable. And I went down the jam band hole. I became full-blown deadhead. And deadhead required more than just buying albums and listening. Basically, you didn't just go to shows. You went on tour. So that took up a lot of the 90s for me. He was traveling around seeing jam bands. So I shelved Van Halen. And with the recent death of Eddie, fairly recent, um, I started to play these records again. And they're fantastic. I mean, I really love the David Lee Roth era. I mean, it sounds, you know, it's not pulling anything out of uh, anything out of the underground here, guys. Just Van Halen for me. That's yeah. it. You know, I, I, I really dig it. Um, Diver Down might be my favorite. I mean, it, they're one of those bands where that, I'll just say the Dave era, because the Sammy, I'm having a hard time, man. I just listened to For Unlawful Carnal Knowledge, and I'm just like, oh, I'm not feeling this. I'm really not feeling it. But um, Van Halen's one of those bands, almost like Led Zeppelin, that at any given time, any one of those records could be my favorite record from them. You know what I mean? Van Halen 1 could be, Van Halen 2 could be, even Women and Children First could be my favorite of the Dave era. Uh, depends on the last one I listen to. It kind of changes a lot. Kind of like I'm kind of like that with Zeppelin. Like I think every single Ed Zeppelin record has been my favorite Zeppelin record at one point, except for like Coda or In Through the Outdoor. Yeah. But um, yeah. So I'm um, just gonna go with Van Halen, and I'm uh, disappointed at myself for like really shelving a lot of this stuff. I shouldn't have. So it's a it's actually good, it's a good pick, and uh, and I, I I like your comparison to Zeppelin, and I'll tell you why. Because there are so many people, like whenever we do these lists here on the channel where we talk about our favorite bands and our favorite albums, and when we don't mention Zeppelin or Van Halen on these lists, like people get offended and they're like, how can any list not have Van Halen or Led Zeppelin on it? 
It's like, like, it's almost like that should be a default for any rock fan. Right. Mm -hmm. And it's like, sometimes there's nothing against those bands. They're both amazing and legendary and great, but sometimes we just like stuff more than others. Right. That's just kind of the way it goes. Right. It's just not enough time in the day or in life to listen to all the music that I like. I mean, it just keeps coming and new stuff keeps coming. And I kind of try to keep one foot in the underground all the time. And, um, so there's always new stuff coming. And when new stuff comes and I get really into new stuff, the older stuff just gets shelled. Yeah, that's the way it goes. You don't hate it. You just, you just stop yeah. listening to it for a variety yeah. of reasons, right? Yeah. Yeah. All right. There's only so many hours in the day. And there's yeah. a lot of I mean, the room. I'm, I mean, you too, Pete, the room I'm sitting in is fucking wall to wall CDs and records sealing the floor. It's obscene. It's They're ridiculous. everywhere. They're everywhere. Yeah. All right. So when we decided we were going to do this, uh, this guy came first to mind and I almost wasn't going to include him today because I know we like tend to talk about more like hard rock and metal stuff on this show. But uh, it, this was just so obvious for me because I, throughout the seventies as a kid, young kid, I just idolized this dude and I listened to him and his band so much. And he was, in, he was in an even more legendary band before that. But like when the early eighties came around, you know, Paul McCartney and Wings broke up and Paul started a solo career and he put out this album, which I bought at the time. And I was like, all right, this is pretty good. I, li- I like the Wings stuff better, but it's still Paul. I love him. And then like literally like immediately afterwards, you know, I'm like up to here listening to Priest and Maiden and Scorpions and uh, Black Sabbath and Deep Purple and soon to be Metallica and all this other stuff. And I never, ever, ever went back to a Paul McCartney album again till real recently, like 40 years later. And I love this guy. I And all, throughout all those years, I was still listening to the old Paul McCartney and Wings stuff, still listening to the Beatles, but I never bought any of his solo albums after this one until recently and there's no real reason why i never never listened to any of them i would hear the occasional hit on the radio and i'd be like oh cool paul's still doing good i just never went and investigated any of it i think to me i was so upset that the band he he, that he broke up the band that i loved so much wings uh but then i got so heavy you know heavy into all this other metal stuff that i didn't even give it a second thought not at all Never even crossed my mind to go and buy a, a Paul McCartney album. Oh, we still love them, right? Oh, we still listen to the old stuff. But I was just like, you know, oh, Paul's got a new album out. It's top of the charts, sold 5 million copies, number one hit single. I was like, cool. Never even considered buying any of it. And like I said, until recently, now I went, I've gone and picked up pretty much all of them. And it's like, yeah, I'm surprised I didn't go for some of this stuff because I am a fan. Uh, but again, better late than never, but yeah, no real reason other than I was just moving on to other things pretty quickly too. So Paul McCartney, Mr. Cans. Okay. Uh, this next band, I can only think of one reason why I stopped listening to them. Um, before we started hanging out again and before any of you guys knew me, I actually wasn't an out of shape piece of shit and I used to run a lot and I listened to Children of Bodom constantly when I was running. And the, the first four albums, I mean, I ate that shit up. I loved them. I mean, I was like, I've never heard anything like this. They play so fast. And the keyboardist is cool, too. Usually a keyboardist is dragging a heavy band down like this or just doing some doomy organ shit in the back. You know, this guy's playing solos and it's exciting and it's great. And, you know, so I listened to the first four albums nonstop for a few years and then... I think right around the time I quit running and started sitting around on my ass a whole lot more, I stopped listening to them. But that was like 2005. I think, am I dead yet? Or are you dead yet? Or whatever that one was that came out that year was the last one I actually bought and listened to. And, you know, RIP Alexi, you know, I didn't stop, you know, because of that, but, and I hadn't really listened to anything between their last output and when I stopped. And I kind of feel like I should check that stuff out. I've always been aware of it, but I never really listened to any of it. So I don't know if it's, they kept going in the same direction or whatever, but I really enjoy those first four albums. They blew my mind. You and know, that's great. Listening. And that's one, that should be one of mine as well. 
Yes, yeah, same here. I was going to say, it's a fantastic pick, and same thing. I like the first couple, and then just jumped off the bandwagon, and I don't, I don't know why. And But they kept putting out records. They kept touring. You know what I think? They, they got pretty me? big, too. They did get pretty big. Yeah. I think one of the reasons why I stopped listening to them, because you guys might remember, they were on every fucking tour for oh, like yeah. five, six, yeah. seven years straight. Like, I must have seen them a lot, like every yep. other month. It seemed yep. like they were opening up for someone else. Uh, Megadeth, Black Label, Touring with Slayer, Ice, Touring Ice with Dirt, with Slayer. I mean, every Marth. time you turn around, yeah. dude, I'm on a Marth. Every time you turn I, around, I, I still forgot about like, that. Yeah. Oh, my God. It's like, you know. Yeah. Yeah. And they, they were legendary for out drinking whoever they were on tour with. And they just had the other bands had to get rid of them because they were so nuts. <laughs> Uh, proper friends, man. Those guys can drink anybody under the table. Oh, yeah. Did I ever tell you about my interview with Alexi? Uh, geez, I don't even remember when this was. Maybe 2007, 2008. I don't know, something like that. And uh, I had an interview scheduled with him at 1130 in the morning. And he was out in California. And actually, no, it was 1130 his time. So it was afternoon my time. And, uh, you know, I call into the number. He picks up the phone. And I could tell right off the bat that there was something up with him. And he's like, hey, man, with his accent, what's going on? I'm like, oh, not much. How are you doing? He goes, well, I just got in. I was out all night, man. I got completely shit-faced last night. And he still sounded completely shit-faced. And I'm thinking, <laughs> all right, it's probably 1130 in the morning, California time. This guy has not turned it off yet, has not gone to sleep. And, and I, as, as we know, since he's passed away, that was pretty much his life every day. So it was just a crazy interview. He was just like, you know, just all over the place. But a uh, guy loved life and just loved to party. And that's what he was all about. Man, I remember Hate Breeder was a great album. And I'm in that same boat because I haven't thought about them in, until this very minute, actually. <laughs> it's been a long time. But yeah, I remember in high school, because I came out when I was in high school. I loved the shit out of it back then. Yeah, because it was fast. Like you said, it was fast as fuck. Like every song was, just, <clears throat> which yeah. I was, I was totally into that. Yeah. They had the shredding guitar solos and the crazy keyboards and the, the vocals were kind of black metalish for a while, yeah. right? And just yeah. you know, hooks everywhere, right? It's yeah. super high energy. Yeah, so much energy. Yeah, good running music. I could see that. Definitely yeah, uh, totally yeah. for that. good analogy. How how old was he when he died? He died young. 43, I thought. Yeah, 40, he's very drank young, and yeah. partied himself to death. Yeah. Oh, damn. 41. Yeah. He was 41, 41. when he died. Wow. Younger yeah. than I thought. Yeah, he had like wow. severe liver issues, and I think some of his organs shut down and stuff. Yeah, he was he was not well, not well at all. All right, Chris Allo. Okay, uh, my next one. I love this band in the '80s. Uh, we talked about them earlier. Uh, I, I jumped on board when the "Feel the Fire" was still the current record back in '86. Uh, uh, talking about Overkill, I was so excited. Uh, when Taking Over first came out and I was able to see them uh, on the 87 tour at Lemoore and it was one of the best shows I'd ever seen and I was just hooked and saw them I couldn't even tell you how many times for years and years bought every record but in sometime in like the mid 90s I remember WFO was like the last record I bought from them which I think was 94 and I don't remember was it 94 right or 95 it was 94 i think yes yeah, right around there and I, I don't remember if i saw them on that tour i might have and i just right there i was out um i don't know what happened i caught them a couple times both in the states and in europe like at festivals and i'd be like oh cool there's a new overkill record like i should check that out but i, I didn't the, the only time i did was once or twice i got the assignment to interview Bobby Blitz, so I would check out whatever that record was, Killbox 97 or whatever the fuck. And I, you know, they did the interview, but threw the album somewhere and that that was it. I, I saw them in, I looked it up uh, and I mentioned it to Pete and we saw Overkill at the Chance, the other, you know, last month. I thought they were really good. Pete and I were trying to figure out, you know, the last time we had each seen them. And I was like, I figured out that I seen them in 2013 with Creator in, in the city. They'd done like a co-headlining tour. So it was like nine years I hadn't seen them or heard any of their records. Uh, and like I said, going back previously, there was real spotty with their records. Um, and I, I'm sure some of them are good, although Bobby Blitz's voice sometimes gets a little shrieky for me. Um, 
but I mean, I do love the old stuff, and uh, I'm sure they have some great tracks. There was a couple songs that they played at the Chance, and uh, which I'd never heard before, and I'm like, oh, yeah, this, this, this does sound pretty good. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. maybe I, I love them more now, almost more than I did back then. Like, just I, I don't know if it's nostalgic. I don't know if it's just the quality of what it is they're doing. But I've seen them on the last couple of tours, and I am like really happy when they yeah. when they when they they're, they're they were great. On yeah, they had a great time. They're killing it. Blitz, these guys have aged. They got a great sense of humor. Blitz comes out and he goes, "After forty years, it's nice to know I'm not the only motherfucker getting ugly." You know, just a good kind of vibe. Kids in the pit, right? Kids in the middle. Kids in the middle of the circle pit young kids 10 11 12 year old kids everybody just having a good time man what i really respect and love overkill now i mean they're killing yeah, they're, they're they're like a bunch of see them. really good go see them they're great yeah. oh hell yeah hell yeah yeah i saw them last november in jersey it was a show that had been delayed for like three years so they played in right. montclair at uh uh the well the yeah. so i've been to a couple shows already where it was like you know i saw like blue oyster cult and stuff you're in seats but that was the first show I've been to in like two years when it's like general admission. So I'm in the fucking circle pit the whole time, just smashing into people, headbutting people, running around like a fucking idiot. They come out with like electro violence, uh, wrecking crew, elimination. As soon as they start playing elimination, I'm like, I think I headbutted somebody. So I'm like, I, this is like the greatest thing ever. So ever since yeah, then, I've been fun, like, oh, right? oh, it's so good. And they sounded amazing. Bobby sounded <laughs> great. Even Edie Bernie's up in the middle. His bass is loud. It's like Lemmy volume, just blowing everything out. Yeah, I was totally into it. And every, I've been on an overkill high since that was like November. Yeah, ever since then, I've been like listening to them all the time. Had on taking over. Like, yeah, it's good shit. Really, I, I, I would have been a good pick actually for the show, but I didn't even think of it. But yeah, that was that a good a great one. pick. That's a great yeah. pick. They were one of my honorable mentions because that, that I had the same thing. I just kind of fell out of touch with them in the early mid 90s and for no no reason. And then right. I think it was like four albums ago or three albums ago, I uh, I was sent one of their newer releases to review for Sea of Tranquility. Right. And uh, I was like, holy shit, this is really good. And then I started picking up some of the other ones and I've gotten every one since then. And I'm like, their, their last handful of albums are really, really good. So it's, I think it's just in the matter of a, a band that's been around forever. They've got a shit ton of albums and, you know, there's just so much bandwidth. We all have to listen to stuff, right? And sometimes just some fall by the wayside for no no apparent reason. So, all right, Ryan. Yeah, we're... All right, so uh, I'm going to go with a, a well-known band here. One of, one of the most well-known bands of ever of all time. And uh, that band is, is Pink Floyd. And uh, I'll tell you why. Uh, I'll tell you why. This is what happened. So when I was first getting into music as a teenager, you know, I got into Slayer, obviously came after the all this shit, but I started getting into a lot of 70s stuff too. And the three albums that kind of like walked me into a lot of 70s rock were Led Zeppelin IV, Black Sabbath, Paranoid, and, uh, you know, Dark Side of the Moon, because it's like one of the biggest albums in the history of fucking everything. And I liked it. I thought it was really good. Obviously, it's a classic album, like almost one of those albums where every song was like a radio hit, you know, it's just that level of mil so millions and billions of copies. I bought that and I bought the wall, which I also love. And I don't, and this is like, this is inexplicable. I couldn't tell you why. Uh, I just didn't get anything else from them for years. And I never stopped liking them. I like those albums, but then I, I don't know. They just kind of got on the back burner. And obviously you can't get away from Pink Floyd. You know, everybody knows them. The shit's on the radio all the time. They have like as, as many famous songs, you know, if you start listening, like, oh, I know that song. I know that song. I know that song. They're one of those bands. <laughs> And then, I don't know, I, 10 years ago, I went and I bought Wish You Were Here, which again, those songs are very famous, you know, Shine On Your Crazy Diamond, Woke Up to the Machine. And I, I actually sat down and listened to the album proper. And I'm like, this is fucking great. This is oh, so yeah. good. And then I bought Animals, which is not a radio hit for them because the songs are kind of, you know, long and obtuse. And that's fucking great. And I'm like, I don't know why it took me like, like all these years from like when I bought Dark Side of the Moon and the Wall. And I just kind of fucked off for a decade or more. Then I finally went back and bought the other ones. And I'm like, you know, then I got obscured by clouds. And then I'm like, all right, I need to stop fucking around. And I dug into it. I'm like, this band's amazing. This stuff's good. And it's totally inexplicable why. Because I never like, ah, eh, I'm sick of Pink Floyd. I don't want to listen to them. That never happened. I just kind of didn't listen. I know. Every, if I threw on Dark Side of the Moon or the Wall, I'm like, this is great. But then it didn't happen that off. I, I don't know. It's weird. It's one of those things. And then it wasn't until I heard Wish You Were Here. And I'm like, I fucked up. And now, now I've, I've righted the ship. So now I've, I listened. I got all their stuff. It's great. I love them. You know, I don't want people in the comments like, I can't believe, you know, no, I'm a big Pink Floyd fan. But, uh, you know, it was definitely well over a decade where I just didn't really listen to them for no reason other than I did it. 
You know, and I was like, why did I stop? I have no answer for that other than I did it. Like the stupidest answer. You know, I'm trying yeah. to put I'm trying to put myself in your shoes right now to think that like how cool it would be for me to have only heard Wish You Were Here and Animals for the first time, like now. Yeah. Well, it was just a couple of years. Mind blowing, right? You know, and what's funny, I'm looking, I'm thinking about it. I'm like, those albums are the two, like Dark Side of the Moon and the Wall bookend those two albums, you know, and their their discography. So for some reason I jumped from one to the other, then check out the two middle. Which now I wish you were here might even be my favorite because I'll throw it on. I'm like, this is fucking yeah, we're still more far. It's just it's on another dimension of amazing. So and all you know, a lot of the other stuff is after, before, and after. School, the Sid Barrett stuff's all great. So I don't know why I just didn't do it. But uh, yeah, I fixed that eventually. Sometimes you'll have to like, what am I doing? I need to I need to dig into this and stop fucking around. And that was exactly my textbook experience with Pink Floyd. I did, and uh, yeah, first time I heard Animals, I'm like, the fuck was I doing? This is amazing. But I, I don't know, but I do. I know it now, and I love it. It's great, and I'm on the boat. So, there you go. For me, my third answer is Pink Floyd. So that's a on the bandwagon, off the yeah. bandwagon, back on once again. For no reason at all, no oh, good reason at all. Yeah. So I have to piggyback a little bit off of Ryan's <laughs> because Pink Floyd for me is one of those forever bands. Like they're just that good. You can rediscover the old stuff, and I've always had them in some kind of rotation. Um, never really shelved them for years. I still, to this day, will pull out an album. But like you said, with Wish You Were Here, the Wish You Were Here especially is an album you got to listen to all the way through. It's a beautiful yeah. piece, the whole thing all the way through. Saxophone solo is great. But my pick uh, was actually solo Roger Waters. And what made me think of this is he's coming around. I've never seen him. I saw Pink Floyd after he left um, in the L.A. Coliseum in 1988. Um Back when the, uh, you know, the, wish, the, uh, the, the uh, f- uh, excuse me, Waters had left already and they were fighting over who's going to own it and all this, but um, it was without Roger Waters. Now he's coming around and he's touring solo and he's playing at the new Nassau Coliseum. I'm not even sure what it's called. They just built a new Nassau Coliseum and I went to look at the prices and I just UBS. got massive sticker shock. UBS, shop. right? UBS Arena, yeah. U- U- USB, something like that. I mean, nosebleed seats, Ticketmaster, $250. So I was just, well, forget it. So then it made me realize that I have not listened to Roger Waters' solo work since the pros and cons of hitchhiking. Wow. which is around 88, 89, 90, somewhere in there. I know the exact year, but he's done some solo work and I haven't heard any of it. I still right now don't know anything that he's done since then. And um, I was going to get all into it. I was excited. I'm going to go see Roger Waters. Let me go catch up on his solo work and see what he's got and see what he's going to do and check out the set list. But once I saw that, the, this is a whole separate show, by the way. Once I saw that uh, the face value Ticketmaster what was charging, I'm like, you know what? I'm going to have to pass. I'm not spending. You know, front row, you can get the floors $500. Sorry. Sorry, guys. So uh, that's Roger Waters, man, and all of his solo. Whatever he's done after, Pete, maybe you could help me out. Has he, has he got a few handful of albums since the pros and cons of Hitchhiking? He's only, he only has a couple of them. So they're, uh, yeah, Amused, not Amused to Death is probably the one you want to check out. That's, that's pretty damn good. Yeah, but uh, yeah, when I saw those prices, that was it. So I, I had Roger Waters on my list just because I just recently did that. Like this week, I was looking to go see him. I got all excited. You know, I saw Pink Floyd. They were great, but... I wanted to see Roger Waters. I'm not going to see him. I'm not seeing him for that price. Sorry, guys. That's a separate show. I hate to Mike, say it, but I had the same. Uh, I had the same. Ex- I've, because, again, this is totally because of my age. I've never seen the Rolling Stones because I, I totally am into the Rolling Stones, but they've toured and they played a couple times, and every time the tickets are through the fucking roof. Yeah. And I'm like, I'm just, I'm not going to pay hundreds upon hundreds upon hundreds of dollars to see a band that I like. But they're not one of my top ten bands of all time. You know, I like them plenty, but. I'm not paying four or five hundred fucking dollars to see the Rolling Stones. So I've never seen them. And now I feel like, you know, obviously they're they're kicking off, you know, hopefully not soon. But, you know, the, the clock is ticking and that it's kind of depressing, but I'm not going to pay, you know, basically yeah. a fucking car payment, you know, and an electricity and an Internet bill rolled into one to see a band. So. Three hundred dollars for a nosebleed seat, a nosebleed seat. I'm like, just how much did you get in the building? Two hundred and sixty four dollars for a half a mile away. Forget it. Ryan, I think when the Stones came around a couple of years ago, I think I paid like 175 for, you know, seats pretty far up. 
And yeah. I'll be honest with you, I didn't, I didn't really enjoy it that much. I don't like, I, I mean, I, I don't like, I don't like going to these shows with 75,000 people anymore. I just don't, I don't, I don't yeah, know. Yeah. I don't like arena shows. I don't like arena I shows. Do it. Like I'll see, uh, I'll see Maiden, but like when I see Maiden, I'm general admission. I'm right by the stage. So I don't really care about everybody behind me. Back, you know, it's not cheap, but it's like maybe 120. But uh, it, I don't know. I'm not a nosebleed guy. Like I can't watch a show on a jumbotron. I, I'll just sit home and sit on the fucking yeah, couch. Yeah, what's the point? Watch the what's band the point? in front of me. So if I wanted right. to see the Stones, which I would have, I'd want good seats. And those were, like you said, five, six hundred bucks. And I could have yeah. seen them for you know, what you said, 175. But I, I don't do jumbotron, yeah. so I'm like, damn, fuck that. I'll just sit home. Yeah, I don't like. See, I'd pay. Point. I'd pay a couple of hundred if the seat was right you know i'm up front i'm gonna be yeah. looking at the guy i'm gonna Ooh. watch him play that bass you know absolutely but 300 dollars to sit a half a mile away in the upper deck of you know uh, a stadium I, no 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 i feel i feel the same way as you pete i'm like nah you know and now if someone gave me a free ticket to see that you know but that's different but to pay that much money and still be like you know six county lines over i'm not gonna fucking do that but mm. uh, that's just me you know? I was gonna say I'm not I'm not a Stones fan, but my uh, my my buddy Dave is a big Stones fan, and my brother-in-law is a big Stones fan. So in 1989, I think it was the Steel Wheels tour, and mm -hmm. I, I I was really good friends with the guy that ran the Ticketmaster. So he would call me up, and any like big show that came in through, he would pull me tickets. They would always be good seats, and I didn't have to wait online or do whatever. Um, so I remember this, when the Stones announced that tour talking to the two of them like did you want to go and i'm not a stones fan but i was like sure i'll go you know but then i got the phone call and it was my my buddy ken was like okay stones tickets are going on sale tomorrow uh you know do you want them and he's like let me tell you how much they are i'll go okay he's like the 30 dollars a ticket and i was like 30 dollars a ticket <laughs> i remember talking to my brother-in-law and my buddy dave and we were like dude 30 dollars i'm never paying 30 dollars for a concert <laughs> ticket we didn't go, and here we are in 2022, and now I'm paying fifty dollars just to park at UBS yeah, Arena. Pay, you pay thirty so, bucks for a fucking beer someplace. Yeah. So. <laughs> so, so yeah, I never, I never saw the Stones, but right, I should have seen them, I guess, in 1989 for thirty dollars. Yeah, yeah. I went to that tour. I saw them on Steel Wheels at Shea Stadium, and uh, and I didn't like the Stones back then. I didn't okay. become a fan until like maybe ten years later. And I remember, to me, that was just an excuse to go to a concert and get highfalutin drunk, and I did. That's what I was thinking. I was like, oh, I'll, go with, I'll go with these guys. And yeah. $30? Yeah. Yeah, I don't even remember what I paid for them back then. Who knows? Too, too long. Too long ago. I don't remember. I have to, I I have have to, to always remember, because we, you know, for years we laughed about that. Like, oh, we'll, ne we'll, never, we'll never pay $30 for a concert ticket. And yeah, well, Back then, most things were like 15 bucks, right? Maybe. I was just yeah. going to say, yeah, back then, you know, tickets were 12, 15 bucks, something like that. I, I think Not Overkill at Lemoore in 87, I think I paid eight bucks. Yeah. I mean, I'll still see concerts for like 20 bucks, but they're like, you know, small places, you know, like seeing like this right. punk and oh, yeah. metal band. If you're going to a place like that, you're paying you know, yeah. way more than 30 bucks. Which, yeah, of course, is a whole other episode. It is, yeah, it the, is. the the last the last I saw Slayer at the Garden. I think face value for the for the final tour was sixty five dollars and a good seat. It was in the right off the floor in the first section up sixty five. That's, that's reasonable. Yeah, that's reasonable. That's actually not bad, you know, all things considered. Yeah, that was pretty good. I mean, I got them the day they went on sale. That was it, right there. You know. All right, yeah. my uh, pick here is. Um... A band I listened to had a couple of their albums in like the late 70s. I was pretty young, but I uh, had some cousins who were into this band. They turned me on to them. I really liked them. And then uh, they broke up and I went and, you know, years later, I got the whole rest of their discography. And then at one point in time, I found out, wow, Bad Company got back together, actually, like much later on without Paul Rogers on vocals. This is their last album in uh, 82, Rough Diamonds. And I was like, oh, cool. Bad Company's back together. Yeah, I should check that out. Never did. And I remember like in the early 90s, they released an album called Holy Water. They were actually, they had a new singer, you know, they like were already like four albums into their career with the, with the new singer. And, you know, they were headlining over Damn Yankees. I saw them in concert at the fairgrounds. And I was like, oh, these guys are pretty good. Never bought any of their albums. Just, just I was always like, to me, I was like, 
I kind of like what I had heard because they had some stuff that was played on the radio and it was, it was pretty cool. Didn't really sound like bad company to me. And I was like, Hmm, I don't know. I love Paul Rogers. I like the early albums. I don't know if this is something I want to, you know, kind of dive into. And I just never did. I never did. Whatever I heard, I thought was okay, but not enough to go buy it all. And uh, yeah, I don't know. Just, just never bothered. It's just an example of me being lazy, I guess, or me like a mental block going up that like, no Paul Rogers, no bad company. I know I shouldn't say that because, you know, we, we've talked about the whole Queens right thing and many other bands who had singers who came on and replaced the legend. Uh, and a lot, in many cases, it usually it always works for me, but I think for me, the whole sound of bad company kind of changed because to me, the original bad company was like a product of the seventies. And you kind of take that sound and that band out of that decade and put them into the late eighties into the nineties and eh, not quite the same, not quite the same. Cause I always thought that, uh, you know, that what I heard sounded fine, just didn't really sound so much like that coming for me. So I never bothered. I never went back on that bandwagon again. So I tell you, Pete, I love, I mean, they were one of the first 70s bands I got into. And I love, love, love those first three albums. And years later, uh, I heard uh, I think Dangerous Age. I think it was Dangerous Age, right? And I fucking hated it. I'm like, this is the stupidest 80s AOR. Just, and I, I hated it. I heard it on YouTube. I hated it so much. Uh, I just completely erased it from my mind and I never listened to anything. So I'm, I'm on that boat and someone will probably comment and maybe some of the other stuff is good. Maybe well, I mean, I, I could, you know, they are, I, I they, they are. And, and I had to go listen to all those albums, right. Uh, numerous times. And actually there's a couple of them that are pretty good. They're not okay. bad. There's a couple of them that aren't good. I think dangerous age is one of them, but I didn't like any of them enough to go say, cause I'm, I'm kind of a completist guy. If it's a band I really like, I usually go and buy all their albums. <laughs> But I was like, yeah, I for this exercise, I went and listened to them all many times just so I could do the show. And some, a lot of times when I do that, I'll actually go out and buy those albums I didn't have. I didn't even bother in this case. I was like, yeah, I don't think I need to have them. I don't need to own them. I, they're OK. They, they are the, they are the quintessential 70s rock radio. Exactly. So, yeah, that's exactly and, and they're I mean. excellent at that. Excellent at that. Yeah, really Once are. they get out of there, that they're, they're in that shoebox. Even the firm with the Jimmy, I didn't really even dig what they were doing there. Um, or is Paul Rogers doing anything? I think Bad Company's like playing county fairs or something. They, they do the greatest hits tour thing in the summertime. Yeah. Right, they do. Yeah, they haven't put out a new album since he got back in the band. They haven't done any new studio albums. I mean, I just looked it up. Dangerous Sages is 88. And I'm, I'm with what Spaghetti said, man, that the 70s stuff, it's like the Great. 70s, like, you know perfect 70s like uh you know radio rock band like down to the fucking exactly. uh, check the box and i heard dangerous age and it was just like shitty 80s aor which but like which i'm okay if it's you know like old like asia i like you know stuff like that but this was not that this was i thought it sucked ass so it was it just like oh what the fuck yeah, is this? it sounded very kind of like boring foreigner ish to me so yeah, that's what i was gonna say yeah, that's 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 right. right. That's Holy Water, I think, is probably the best out of all those albums for me. I thought that okay. was pretty good, but again, I don't even, I didn't really feel the need to own it, you know. So I'll stick with the old ones. I'll be that guy. Yeah, I hear you. Yeah, because those yeah, albums, those early ones are classics. I saw the second singer. Uh, I forget whatever his name was, but uh, he played at a motorcycle rally I was at, and um, it was it was fun because he did his band company songs, but he also did the Paul Rogers songs. And, yeah. you know, be, being dr being drunk at a motorcycle rally and actually hearing songs you, you knew and liked. Uh, but I remember he came out, you know, he had like, uh, he kind of reminded me looks wise of like, he, he looked like he was trying to be David Coverdale. So the 80s analogy definitely, I remember he had like the, the long, you know, fringe leather coat and the, the, the big hairspray hair. And um, yeah, it was, it, it was interesting. But yeah, I, I wouldn't yeah. go back and listen to any they're, of that. They're a Jump the Shark band. It's just like Joe Cocker too. Joe Cocker in 1970 was really cool. Joe Cocker in 1980, not not cool. Just not cool. Right over there. <laughs> not cool. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's Brian only... Brian Howe is is, is a really was a really good singer. It, it's just um, again, I just I, I think me, I just kind of I just had a hard time accepting that band without Paul Rogers, and it, it was like I don't remember how many years it was between albums. So. Uh, it was only four. So like Rough Diamonds, the last one with Paul Rogers, 82, then Fame and Fortune was 86. 
So it wasn't that long that they yeah, waited, no. but I just, and again, by 86, man, I wasn't listening to bluesy hard rock stuff like that for the most part. Right. I was heavily into thrash and all that other stuff. And I was just kind of like, all right, you know, yeah. whatever. Anybody got any honorable mentions? I was going to say, I the only yeah, I got one. Okay. Uh, Chris, you go first. I was going to say, the only one that I really had, um, you uh you and pete you and you and ryan mention them a lot every time you bring them up i'm always like yeah i should check them out again i used to love them blue oyster cult oh i mean i i love them in the 80s you know i remember getting fire and of unknown origin in like 84 85 and i'm just completely blown away i thought it was the greatest fucking record then i went both ways you know i started i went back and bought all the old stuff and then whatever new stuff came out i saw them a bunch of times they were great live, but then I think it was a. There's like the, a record which has like a weird like lady's half face on it. Is it God forbid, or heaven? No, it's forbid. Heaven forbid. Heaven yeah, forbid. Which is a really good album. It's That's a really, really heavy album. album. I see. I fucked up because that was the one I didn't buy, and I remember I'd be like, oh yeah, oh yeah, I should get that new BOC record, and then they came around and. I just I didn't go, and then they did themselves know, no favors with that album cover. Let me tell you, no. yeah, it's a it's shitty cover. Were, I, I, it's, I saw them twice. Uh, I saw them at a motor motorcycle rally like ten years ago, and they were really good. And I saw them a couple of years before that, open for Leonard Skinner, and they were really good. And both times, I was like, oh, I should check out their new stuff. You guys, everybody, uh, not a single person has said a bad word about the new record. Everybody says oh, it's great. Amazing. Uh, I have I it all the time. When they played Middletown, I was like, oh, maybe I should go. I even clicked on the Ticketmaster thing, and then I didn't buy the tickets, and they played the Ridgefield Playhouse in Connecticut. I was like, oh, yeah, maybe I should go to this. I made it to Ticketmaster, but I didn't buy the tickets. So, yeah, I don't know. They're one band that should be discovered by a whole new generation of people, especially people that are into stoner rock now. Oh, I mean, Blue yeah. Oyster Cult fits right there. They're so good. I, that catalog what, is so good. I see them, I, I mean, for the last, I don't know, decade, I've been seeing them like twice a year. Like, I've seen them so many fucking times now. And I hate to say, the crowd is generally on the older side. You see some yeah. younger people that, like, their parents will bring, you know, some kids but uh, yeah, they could really do to get a newer. Uh, that, that, Dude, that if I see them, like they're, they're, they're doing these stoner desert festivals, man. If Blue Oyster Cult could get into that, start doing that, they get a whole new audience because that, that music is just perfect. Well, you oh, would love. think that all these young kids who are all into Ghost, right? And they've obviously heard and read the reviews that, you know, everybody compares Ghost on the vocal front to a lot of the old classic Blue Oyster Cult stuff. You would think that some of these younger folks who are into Ghost would kind of go and listen to the band that probably you know really influenced them highly. So, I see them all the time, and yeah, it's, it, it hasn't. I mean, the, the shows are packed, you know, but it's ninety five percent older folks, you know, and that's just yeah. Sucks. No, that's, they, that's they, they, they could really... be rediscovered by a younger audience yeah. for sure. They, yeah. they could grow that. They could grow that fan base quickly. Funny little quick side note: I had a. The city's on flame in my head the other day. Just that riff, that right, and I just wanted to hear it real quick, so I typed it into YouTube, and there's a bunch of covers on it. So I heard the Iced Earth version and uh, Killer, and um, uh, Church of Misery does a really brutal, yep. almost doomy, unbelievable cover of that tune. Great song. So yeah, Blue Eyes to Cult. Cool. Uh, like, discover Chris, Blue Eyes to Cult if you haven't. Definitely. Oh yeah, Chris. If you haven't heard that new album, "Symbol Remains," yeah, I, I uh, it. everybody I says have. it's amazing. It's fucking unbelievable. I, I, when I heard, I, I assumed it was going to be good, and they're one of my favorite bands. So I was like, kind of program myself to be like, I gotta it's listen be good. to that. It's it's, it's every new. Is that, is that this year or late twenty one? Uh, it's like a year ago, maybe a year and a half ago. I think. Yeah, that was when it came out in November twenty twenty. I'm gonna listen. I haven't listened to it. It's every song. It's it's classic Boys to because every song is different. Every song is like, you know, it gets an earworm and it's just, it's fucking, I've been listening to it nonstop since it came yeah, out. It's, it's great. Wow. Variety, a little bit of everything, everything that you've come to expect from Lawyers to Call over the years, there's, there's all of those elements are on this album. Totally. Buck sounds good. Eric sounds good. The new guys are kicking ass. So yeah, it's a good album. Well yeah. worth your time. Really good. Cans, you got uh, a uh, honorable mention? Had a few. Um, uh, revocation. 
uh, band, extreme metal band. The guitar player is absolutely fucking lights out, unbelievable. Yeah. Yep. I know they're still around. Haven't really checked anything out lately. Um, Decapitated. They just put out a new single, which I haven't listened to. Um, but I had forgotten they even existed before that came out. I'm like, yeah, I used to love Decapitated. You know, they've already risen from the ashes once. So I'll probably go back and check that out. And then uh, Silosis, another band I used to listen to all the time and forgot they existed until this show while we were talking. I'm like, wait a minute. And I'm pretty sure they're still putting music out. So probably three or four albums behind on them. But just stop listening. Don't know why. Yeah, Decapitated is a great pick. I haven't listened to them either. Yeah, same here. Uh, that's, I remember all the, the, the whole fiasco with them, the whole the legal stuff, but yeah. I still yeah. don't remember any buying, hearing any of the records for the last, I don't know, whatever it is, five Man, years, they, they years. just put out a single last Friday. So. Their first two albums kicked out. I thought their first two albums were fucking great. Yeah, oh, I haven't listened yeah. to that. Well, they were being hailed as like the next great, like kind of like technical death metal band, and then yeah. all the shit happened, and it's like they just kind of got forgotten. Like, didn't two 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 different guys in the band tragically passed away? I right? think it was Rummer was, was in it. Get, like, run over by a tractor in Poland. Yeah, and crazy it was stuff. some fuck to like talk about a that's a whole nother show. Bands with bad luck. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, uh, that's that you could name a you could do five shows about that because that's a yeah. <laughs> that is such a good job, bro. Yeah, that's not yeah, I could have sworn that's what it was. Like one of the dudes got one guy died, and then another dude, like I think, got ran over by a tractor or something. Mm-hmm. Or we'll lawnmower. Look right now, some fucking thing. There was a. I don't want. I don't want to go off the reservation, but there was a New York hardcore band that I've seen more than any band on the earth called Candiria. I used What's to see them like every week in the nineties. I, I saw them. They played all over. I saw them in Brooklyn, Manhattan. They played up here, and. uh at some point in the early 2000s, they were touring and they got in a really, really bad like van accident. Like, the driver fell asleep and it was just fucked up. Now, nobody died, but like they were all sidelined for, for a long time. And uh, yeah, it took a long time for them to come back. I think the last, I, they came back and I saw them at CBGB's, one of the last shows there where they shut down. And it was like their big comeback show and the place was a fucking riot. Like, people swinging from the rafters kind of show. And uh, yeah, and then they just kind of fucked off for a long time. But yeah. Bad, bad luck, man. I remember reading about that accident. Like, these guys are dead. Like, the way full speed collision at, like, you know, highway speeds in a, in a touring van, you know? Oof. Yeah, yeah their, their tour bus collided with a truck carrying wood in Gamal in, uh, near the border of Russia and Belarus in 2007. Oh. V10 died, right. uh, like, a few days later at the age of 23. And oh. then Coven slipped into a coma and was later moved to Poland. Um, yeah. So one guy died and one guy's in a coma. Yeah. I remember that. And, and then in 2011, their plane crashed, but they all lived. <laughs> and then after that was the whole sexual assault yeah. allegations. Yeah. What year was that? That was a couple of years later, I remember. Yeah. Oh, that was right. I remember that. That fucked them up, too. That was oh, for thing. sure. They were arrested and... Yeah, that was... Uh, Ooh, well, I mean, eventually, right? I think they were, they were cleared... But I think, man, that's like Leonard Skinner level of shit luck, man. That is, yeah, uh, that is yeah. true. They're, they're yeah. cursed. Yeah, and their yeah. new album's coming out at the end of May. Cancer culture on nuclear blast, right. but, and that's their first really? like, anti cult in 2017. I never even heard anti cult. Blood mantra was in 2014. I don't think I, yeah, that one I heard. That's the last one I heard. So yeah, huh. crazy, crazy. Ryan, you got any honorables? Oh yeah, I got one. It's the same uh, <clears throat> same style of music as KMFDM, and I got into them really young. But the same situation as Pink Floyd. Uh, it was a Canadian industrial band in the '90s called uh, '80s and '90s called a Frontline Assembly, and uh, so this is their '94 album, Millennium. Uh, this album's notable because it actually is one of the first times that a fellow played guitar. So most of their stuff isn't really heavy. It's like heavy, but not with you know heavy metal guitars. But this one's got a lot of metal guitars on it. Uh, the guitarist is a fellow by the name of Devin Townsend before he uh, went on to do a uh, strappy and lad and all the solo stuff. But he really, this is one of the big things. He's, so I bought this album in high school. It came out in 94. Loved the shit out of it. Uh, it's the same style as came FDM ministry, nine inch nails, like same, same thing going on there. I bought one or two other albums and then I just didn't buy anything else. 
for no reason. And it was like, my thing, like 20 years later, I'm sitting there and I heard a song on YouTube. I'm like, what the fuck album is this on? I look it up. I'm like, this is fucking amazing. And I start digging, you know, I'm like, whoa, whoa, this is great. And I, uh, I'm like, why did I stop listening to these guys? No reason. Just whoop, right out of my head. So uh, I've since rectified that. And uh, now I have all their stuff and they're a great band and I love them. But uh, yeah, I don't know why. I took like 20 years off from these guys for no good reason at all. But uh, yeah, the 94 album, Millennium, is uh, if you were into that kind of industrial metal, Nine Inch Nails, like that sound, yeah, this I think this is probably as good as that sound's ever going to get. It's really, really fucking good. So that's my uh, honor- one honorable mention. Cool. Spaghetti, you got any? No, no one on the honorable mention. I mean, this is the kind of topic that if, if you give me enough time, I could make a list of, of, of 20 of these, 20 of these, sorry, 10 yeah, lists. Sure I mean, it's easy well, top. I mean, uh, after Afterburner, I didn't pay any attention. Now they're putting out good records again, supposedly. Yeah. I don't know. So, no, not really. Okay. Not really. My last one for today, this was, uh, Ryan just mentioned, like, going 20 years without listening to it any new music from a band you really like a lot freaking saxon was it for me this is the last album i bought like in the mid 90s and i like this a lot i listen to this today and i'm like this still album still kicks ass i still I got a crutch on her if you hold that up oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what yeah. a face yeah. ah, what a face i forget what her name was she was a popular model at the time but um but yeah i just stopped listening to saxon I didn't get back on board the Saxon train till like Lionheart, which is like literally almost 20 years after wow. the, this one. And uh, and I've since gone back and gotten all those. And I'm like, God, how did I, how was I not listening to Saxon? But, but again, you know, uh, the, here's another factor too. Sometimes these bands like back in the day were hitting their stride, hitting big here in the States. And then all of a Good sudden point. they Especially had a couple Saxon. of, yeah, the, all of a sudden a couple of the album sales slipped. They stopped touring here. They get there's no marketing. They're releasing albums, but there's no promotion here, no nothing. And we've all moved on to other things, right? So that to me, Saxon, I I literally thought they broke up for years. But then I, you go back and look, and they were busy as ever. They just weren't busy doing anything here at all in the states. So that's another fact, somebody, right? how many bands fall into that. Kind of I mean, after after Denim and Leather and uh, you know Wheels of Steel, I I it was. A desert from them. I didn't hear anything from them. For oh, Crusader. Uh, Crusader was pretty big here. Yeah, I was gonna yeah. say. I think Crusader. Well, what's the one? Uh, Power and the Glory Power is the actually Glory. their biggest selling yeah. record. That's, yeah, that's that song is like I can't listen to that song without like flipping tables over. But yeah. <laughs> Crusader, the album, I think the artwork's cool, but it's kind of like I don't think it's their best stuff. But yeah. it's not. They're in, they're yeah. they're another band that thrash sort of. I shelved it. They were just they were like light metal. Well, plus two, they they Instant. you know they definitely toned down their style when everybody yeah. was getting into the heavier stuff. Yeah, you got a little and, talk. Yeah, exactly like Pete said, their their profile in America just completely shit the bed. Yeah, they they were on a trajectory to do big things here, and they just yeah, you're yeah. right. You know, they released the single from this was Broken Heroes. They had a video on MTV, which I like a lot, but is that really what they should have been promoting from this album, right? Right. Not really. You know, I remember, uh, I don't remember who the hell it was, but somebody back years ago was very insistent. I listened to their 2001 album, Killing Ground, which in 2001, like, how, well, who was Saxon? But I mean, I, remember, I heard it. I'm like, this is, this is like the Saxon you want to hear. It's oh, good, totally, yeah. proper, heavy, British heavy metal, no bullshit. And uh, has like a very nondescript cover, just like a, you know, a, a, a like a, a helmet on it. But yeah, it was definitely one of those albums that I think, because nobody else mentioned it. And I remember one guy was, you got here, Killing Ground. And other than that one guy, I never heard anybody be like talking about Saxon back then. Lionheart was like 2003 or four, maybe. Yeah. You know, same thing. I don't remember anybody talking about that album when it came out. Yeah. That went under, went under the radar big time. But I mean, another example of, and we talked about a lot of them today, where you got a, a, an old veteran band who is making some of the best music of their career, like in yeah. recent years. I mean, these, these last couple of handful of Saxon albums. Right. Are killer. Oh, they're fucking awesome. They're really yeah, good, yeah. Yeah. So, Definitely. all right, everybody, there you have it. Uh, on the bandwagon, off the bandwagon. So, uh, any bands that happen to fall into this category for you, please put them down in the comments below. And I uh, want to thank the guys here for uh, coming on board today and uh, talking about some of this, uh, some of these 
good bands that we just kind of forgot about over the years. And it happens. It happens. And like Spaghetti said, if you uh, give us a little bit of time, I'm sure we can come up with a lot more of these. And uh, if you if you like this uh, topic, tune in tomorrow night on In the Prog Seat. We'll be doing the exact same thing, except talking mostly of prog bands. So uh, stay tuned for that. And a lot more here on the channel. Visit us on the web at www.seatranquility.org. We're on Facebook. We're on Twitter. Of course, we're here on YouTube all damn time we got uh coming up like i said tomorrow night in the proxy wednesday is new album review day uh we've got i think new crowbar coming up this week and a couple of the goodies uh thursday is the monsters den and uh friday we've got uh the, the friday morning at the fun house with martin popoff and myself on saturday we have the uk connection with simon brain Stephen reed and then sunday we've got album homework assignments so lots of good stuff happening here on the channel please subscribe if you haven't already click on that notification bell and uh we'll see you all bright and early tomorrow morning with feel good songs for spring and tomorrow night for in the prog seat for chris canzanari chris Allo, ryan scout spaghetti lee imp pardo good night everybody see you next monday bye-bye